book of Hebrews chapter 12 if you don't mind standing Hebrews chapter 12 and I direct your attention to verse number 14 the writer of Hebrews and most scholars note that Paul was the writer of the book of Hebrews and Paul in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 he says follow peace everybody say peace with all men and holiness everybody say holiness without which no man shall see the Lord now before I go to my next verse let me just say church holiness is important to God therefore if it's important to God it should be important to us therefore we must live a lifestyle of holiness we must walk holy amen now don't get quiet on me now we must talk holy and with that thought, I'm, I'm reminded of a scripture, if I may read it to you. In James, the first chapter, I, I know I'm digressing, but I'm going to go back to my next verse. James chapter 1, verse 26, in the New Living Translation, it says, If a person thinks he is religious, one translation says, says he is a Christian, but does not keep his tongue, from speaking bad things. He is fooling himself. His religion is worth nothing. You know, we live in a day and hour where people just say anything. We live in a day and hour where people just curse and say all kinds of profanity. And then on the flip side, they'll turn around, oh, I love God. I mean, they just curse and bloop, 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 bloop. Oh, I love the Lord. This is the kind of hour we're living in. Right, right. Amen. Amen. Athletes do it. They're on the field talking trash, on the court talking trash, cursing at one another. And then they're going to get on the podium and have the press conference. I just want to thank the Lord. I love the Lord. If a person thinks he is religious or says that he's a Christian but does, not, but does not keep his tongue from speaking bad things, he is fooling himself. His religion is worth nothing. You see, when you live in a holy life, you, you guard what you say. Amen. I, I question people that say, they, that, 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 that say they're saved. That everything, every time you listen to them, curse words coming out of their mouth. Something wrong. But, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Let's go to verse 15. Looking diligently. Looking diligently. Lest any man fail the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby many be. Defile. Father, we thank you today for the presence of God that we feel today. Mm. I just plead your blood, Lord, over this service. You have come to speak to your people. I pray that, God, you help us to, to focus. Don't let our minds wander. Don't let us get distracted. But, God, help us today. We need you today, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we, we look to you, God. I can't do anything without you, God. Touch my mind. Anoint my lips of clay, God. Let me just speak, Lord, as the pen of a ready writer. That God, I may help and bless your people, Lord. I need you. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. As I noted, I want to address something. Now, this is not the first time that... I have, may have covered this subject. I think I covered this subject, if my memory serves me correctly, and me looking at my notes, on Sunday, November the 6th, 2022. I talked about this subject, but from a different 
angle and title. Then I think the message was simply entitled, push back the pool of bitterness. But today my subject title and everything I say today is totally different from what I said on November the 11th, or excuse me, November the 6th, 2022, if my memory serves me correctly. But today my subject title is The Trap of Bitterness. The trap of bitterness. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't get bitter. I, I want to take my time because I, I want to lay some foundation here. Now, first of all, let me say the late Nelson Mandela. And some of you know of Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela once said, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Bitterness, if not properly dealt with, will eventually affect you mentally, emotionally, physically, and it will kill your spirituality. Bitterness, if it goes unchecked, will ultimately destroy a person's walk with God. I'm going to prove it to you. But what is bitterness? Now, as I was going through Strong's Concordance and studying the Hebrew and Greek variations of the word bitter and bitterness, I found it to be very eye-opening, to say the least. And one could expect the obvious definition of bitterness, such as bitterness is outrage and dissatisfaction at being dealt with unjustifiably. Bitterness, as defined, is a lingering anger, an anguish at something that happened in the past, and you can't let it go which these definitions are accurate. But in this portion of scripture that we look at in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, it uses the specific Greek word, pikria. This, this, this Greek word, pikria, it literally in the Greek is defined as, quote, a bitter root that produces bitter fruit. The biblical definition explains exactly why bitterness will destroy one's spirituality. Although you have to understand that, that bitterness does not start as a great monument or as a great tree in someone's life. But rather bitterness starts as a small seed. Bitterness comes in one's life from negative experiences. Bitterness is the result of the cycle of hurt. The cycle of anger that starts with a little pain that builds over time until it becomes a deep-seated feeling of sadness, anger, and hopelessness. But if that seed that is sown is avoided, that seed will grow into a great tree and its roots will go deep into a person's life. 
thus resulting in bitter fruit produced in every action of one's life. Amen. But I must say this, that bitterness can last until the last breath that one breathes on the earth. Amen. Now, let me say this. I, I'm in no way trying to discount, discredit anyone's experiences or pain in life. Because I fully understand that pain and hurt are real. Talk to me now. We all, as adults, have gone through some sort of betrayal. And heartache. Now stay with me. I, I might not holler and shout. But I got to teach you something. Preach to you something. Because I got to help you. Amen. And through the help of the Lord. You, you, you can overcome this. Amen. The intent of my message really is to expose. And uproot. The bitterness. That can be planted in one's heart by the attack of the enemy amen I want to help you overcome it you may not deal with it now but the enemy is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour but I want to make you better not bitter it's time that the church get better than bitter I, I feel in the Holy Ghost that a lot of times we got people who are spiritually mature because they say but emotionally, they're not mature. And you will never get emotionally mature. We got too many people in the church today who say they're spiritually mature because they say they call scripture, they read Bible, but they're not emotionally mature. But you can never get emotionally mature when you got a root in your life. Talk to me. See, see, for the church to really thrive and be vibrant and impactful, we got to get more than just being spiritually mature. It's time some of God's people get emotionally mature. Amen. 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 It's good to know scripture. It's good to be saved and to be spiritually mature. But you got to get to a place in your life where you become emotionally mature. I think this is where the church is lacking. Talk to me. Now, you, if you don't talk to me, I'm going to still preach. Amen. So if you're going to make this thing go better, you, you need to talk to me and preach with me and help me. Amen. God said to somebody right now, it's time for you to get emotionally mature. Take all that word you know and apply it. Take all that scripture you quote and apply it. So you can bring some emotional maturity, stability in your life. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's been stated by, by, thank God for all our teachers. Give our teachers a round of applause. Sister Kareem. Amen. Where are all our teachers? Raise your hands if you teach. Where Brother Patty Foe? Hey, my, I, I, I'm missing one other. Where's the other one? Amen. Sister Myra, praise God. We appreciate our teachers. And you pray for them. It's been stated by teachers and academic scholars and a lot of the, the brilliant minds that the best way to learn something is through captivating or giving a story or narrative. And this morning I want to share you, share with you a real biblical narrative. And I share it because I, I hope that, that somebody will stay focused and pay attention long enough to gain some biblical insight from real Bible people who became ensnared by bitterness. But I also want you to see how it, it affected them. Amen. Why? 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 So you don't fall into the same deadly trap. 
Now, some of us, most of us, we know of David. We know that David is one of the most recognized, preached about, and studied Bible figures. Would you not agree? And with all of, of, of David's accolades, he is also one of the most relatable Bible characters. I say that because David is known for being a ferocious warrior, a very inspirational leader, a prosperous king. But most of all, he's noted as a man after God's own heart. Amen. Amen. And the Bible tells us that, that David was a man that was surrounded, surrounded by men and women who helped guide him in his kingdom. Can I go to say you, you need somebody around you that's going to help guide you along the way. And, and David had some people surrounding him that, that guided his life. Some of his closest relationships included people such as Uriah, the Hittite, who was one of David's mightiest warriors. Amen. Another close relationship that David had was with Jonathan, the eldest son of King Saul, a loyal friend. Amen. And covenant brother with David. We need loyal people. Jonathan was loyal to David. If you're going to build a church, you're going to need some loyal people. You don't need no backstabbing people. You don't need no gossiping people. Amen. We need some loyal people. Amen. I said we need some loyal people. And, and Jonathan was a loyal person. Uh, are you loyal? Uh, are you just putting up a front? But Jonathan wasn't putting up no front. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. He was a covenant brother to David. Another close relationship that David had was with Benaiah, one of David's mighty, valiant warriors. Amen. Benaiah was a commander of the third rotational army division. And the Bible lets us know that Benaiah was a man who chased a lion into a pit. And killed it. It's the kind of people David had around him. Amen. But another person that played a very significant role in David's life was a man by the name of Ahibothel. Ahibothel. Ahibothel was one of David's most trusted trusted counselors and advisors. Ahithophel was anointed man of God to the point that he gave David counsel and advice all the time. And to let you know the type of man that Ahithophel was, look at the Bible in 2 Samuel chapter 16. Stay with me. 2 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23, in the New Living Translation, it says this about Ahithophel's counsel. Notice this. In the New Living Translation, it says this. For every word Ahithophel spoke seemed as though it had come directly from the mouth of God. Woo! If Ahithophel was around today, and was on social media, a hither there would have a lot of followers. Because people would want to hear when he opened his mouth what thus saith the Lord. If hither there was around today and there was a NAYC con convention, conference, and he was on the schedule to preach, they would need two football arenas to pack the place out. Amen. I mean, picture here's a man that the Bible said that, that when he spoke, it seemed as though, amen, words had come out of his mouth directly from God. Amen. 
That's anointing. That is powerful. And this is the kind of man David had around him. That when he needed advice, when he needed counsel, he went to Hitho. And he spoke. But just one chapter later, we read these words about Ahithophel. One chapter later, I want you to notice what the Bible says about this man. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. Now, you know what we just read in 1623. Notice what we read now in 1723. And when Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed. He saddled his ass and arose and got, got him home to his house, to his city, and put his house in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Now, some of you may not even recognize this name, Ahithophel. But there's something quite perplexing about this man. In one chapter, one chapter, we read that his words that were, were so powerful and prolific that it seemed that his wisdom came directly from the mouth of God. But one chapter later, we find a hell hung himself. Now, if anybody like me, that quick and shocking shift in behavior makes one scratch their head. How did this happen? What was it that caused Ahithophel's wise counsel that was comparable to God? But what caused Ahithophel to hang himself and commit suicide? As I mentioned, King David is, is, is one of the most revered and, and relatable figures in the Bible. And this is not only because of it, all of his inspirational psalms, but it was also for his significant failures. Amen. And however, it didn't matter how devastating David's failures were, David always was able to recover and maintain his faithfulness with God. David's most notable, we know most of us, failure included, now get this, it included his friend, Uriah. And with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. Because when you look into 2 Samuel chapter 11, the Bible says, talks about how one day David was in his kingdom. First problem was he shouldn't have been there. He should have been on the battlefield. First problem started with the fact he was not where he needed to be. Can I tell somebody, you need to get where you need to be. So God can do what he want to do. He should have been on the battlefield leading the men. But instead, he was back home in the kingdom. And while there, the Bible tells us, you know the story, most of you. David walked onto his rooftop, looked down, and saw Bathsheba bathing naked on the rooftop. Now, stay with me. Understand, now, I, I already mentioned David knew Uriah. Not only did David know Uriah, he knew Uriah's Rife. The Bible tells us that, that Uriah was one of David's elite soldiers. Uh, Uriah was one of David's famous 30 mighty men of war. And that Uriah was a part of David's inner circle. And so you, you got to look at it from this standpoint. If Uriah had been around and had a modern day wedding today. David probably would have most likely been maybe the best man or one of his groomsmen. This is how close 
David and Uriah was. So when David saw Bathsheba, David likely was not seeing some random woman he had never seen before. David knew exactly who Bathsheba was because Uriah was his close friend. Amen. And so now David is so infatuated and full of lust with what he saw that he summons Bathsheba. He knew that she belonged to Uriah. Summons her to come to my house. She came, he slept with her, committed adultery with her. How does a man do that to somebody so close to him? That's another subject. But he knew them very well. They might have been over one another's house, fellowshipping together, eating together. Amen. But so David's so infatuated now. He gets her to come to his house. He sleeps with her, commits adultery. And later, Bathsheba announced to King David, I'm pregnant. And when David heard this, in an attempt to cover his sin, David recalled Uriah back from the battlefield. He said, get Uriah back here to the kingdom. Get him off the front line. In hopes that Uriah would come home. He'd been away from his wife a long time now. Get Uriah to come back home. Because I know the moment he come back home, he's going to have some intimate time with his wife, and he's going to have some intercourse, and... And, and then all of a sudden, Uriah going to think that he is the father of that child. And David would avoid this devious, deceptive, trickery situation. And stay with me. Amen. But Uriah proved how faithful and committed he was both to God and the king. And when he was recalled back from war, Uriah refused to take privileges that his soldiers did not have. Showing his loyalty and commitment. Amen. Uriah did not return home after talking with David. You read in the story? Even after David got Uriah drunk. He got him back home. He said, I know the minute he get off, get home and get some liberty. I know dude going home. But Uriah was loyal and faithful. I, I can't do this with my men out on the battlefield. I can't do this. They, they out there fighting. I love her. She know I love her. We'll see each other when the war is over. But, but David saw that wasn't working. So he got Uriah drunk. Amen. Thinking that Uriah would get so drunk and he would stagger home, lay in the bed with his wife. Amen. But that didn't work. And so in aspiration to cover up his sin, David sent Uriah back to Joab on the battlefield. But he sent a message with him to Joab. Put him on the front line. Because in the siege of Reba, I know Uriah going to die. Send him back, but put him right on the front line. And that's exactly what he did. And when word came back, what happened? Uriah died. When word got back, that Uriah died on the battlefield, Bathsheba wept. And although I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm somewhat led to believe, and I'm sure that David felt remorse for causing his friend's death. He also, though, I think felt comfort somewhat that in his mind he successively 
covered his sin. But what happened in David's life is that lust literally caused David to go from the peeping Tom to a murderer. David murdered Uriah with his order to Joab to put him on the front line. And what happened as a result of that seed he sowed, it displeased the Lord. To the point that the prophet Nathan confronted David and told him a parable. And the message of this parable that the prophet told, it, 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 it caused David to condemn himself. And he ashamedly admitted his sin. He confessed to the prophet, I'm the man. I did it. And so David confronted, or Nathan confronts David. But, but he also let David know that you will not be judged. But you need to know the unborn child of that pregnancy with Peshiba, that child's going to die is judgment of this sin you committed. And it's going to have lasting consequences for you as the king. Now, the pain of the aftermath of David's selfish sin, you can read it in Psalms chapter 51. In Psalms 51, David confesses his sin before the Lord and repents. Can I tell you, if you fall short of the grace of God and you sin, you have an advocate. There's still hope. There's still hope. You and maybe run your mouth so much and talked about everybody from, amen, California, amen, to North Carolina. But there's still hope. If you put that long, unruly tongue on the altar. Amen. Yes, sir. There's hope. I don't care what you've done. There's hope. I don't care what you've done. There's hope. There's hope. Amen. There's hope. Amen. And so David in Psalm 51 confesses the sin, and I can only imagine how David must have felt that day, maybe as he laid on the ground, confessing his, confessing his sins from this deep, Remorse within his heart, full of guilt, full of shame, repenting, weeping, asking God to forgive him. However, in spite of this devastating and lasting consequence, the Bible lets us know in 2 Samuel 12, 13, 14, that God reveals through scripture, he forgave David. Amen. And you know what that tells me? It, it, it lets us know there's hope for all of us. And this is where the story would have seemed to come to an end, which brings me to my point of what I really want to bring home. But you got to understand David's actions and seeds that he sold had left an effect on someone else who was just as close to David. And that was Ahithophel. Because if you read in the Bible, the Bible tells us in, 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 in 2 Samuel, and I'm not going to read it, chapter 23, verse 24, the Bible tells us that Eliam, Eliam was the son of Ahithophel. The Bible lets us know that Ahithophel had a son whose name was Eliam. And this name Eliam might not mean much to you, but the scripture reveals that Ahithophel had this son by the name of Eliam, who also, Eliam had a daughter whose name was Bathsheba. And according to scripture, Eliam was the father of Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Therefore, Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. And one can only imagine what Ahithophel went through during this situation. Ahithophel was one of David's most trusted counselors and advisors. Ahithophel was David's most trusted counselor and advisors on a regular basis. And then he eventually sees Bathsheba with David. 
Can you imagine now what emotionally is going on in Ahithophel? That's my granddaughter. This man, who was close to me, killed her husband. Slept with her. And now he finds out she's pregnant. And Ahithophel knew he didn't come home. Amen. Can you imagine the bitterness? Can you imagine the resentment? Can you imagine the anger Ahithophel felt? How could David do this to his own people? How could David do this? To his close friend. And Ahithophel's own family. But the Bible lets us know. That Ahithophel never said anything. He couldn't. That was the king. After all. So what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Ahithophel. Held it inside. Life and Holy Ghost. He held it inside until the bitterness ravaged his insides. Ahithophel, while this was happening, he never realized God forgave David. Amen. He never realized that the loss of the child was the consequence of David's sin. But yet Ahithophel they waited for the right time to enact revenge on David. And doing all of this, something else happened. Absalom, David's son, rose up. See, a lot of the stuff David was sowing in his life, he was planting seed in his son. And so now, what David has sown now Absalom rises up in rebellion. Amen. Because what? He wanted to be king. And now Ahithophel thought, wow, this is my chance. Because the Bible lets us know now that Ahithophel now makes an alignment with Absalom. Because in his mind, he said, I'm going to leave David. Because I'm going to make an alignment with Absalom. I'm going to now be Absalom's close advisor. Because I know Absalom heard when I opened my mouth. It sounded like words coming from God that I gave to his father. But Absalom didn't realize something. There was something going on in a hither there. And so now a hither there saying to Absalom, you, you see this kingdom? This could be yours. Don't you know, Absalom, your daddy getting old. It's time for a new king. You know, people put stuff in your spirit. I feel the Holy Ghost. God putting some stuff in, not God, but the devil putting some stuff in your spirit that's contrary to what God is telling you. You better, let's, you better stop. Feel, help me, help, help me, Holy Ghost. You better stop letting people put stuff in your spirit. And because Absalom thought, well, Ahithophel was a powerful man of God, that when he opened his mouth, everything he said sounded like it come directly from God. And see, you got people, I don't know who I'm talking to, I'm trying to help somebody right now. But you got people talking into your life. And because they know scripture, you think it's coming from the mouth of God. And so now Ahithophel's made this alignment with Absalom. You see all this? It's yours. So now Absalom's getting all this counsel and advice from Ahithophel. But what's interesting when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 17, eventually what happens, and God, God's behind all of it. 
Absalom decides to go with someone else's counsel. Who's shy? The archite. He comes along, but, but he don't even realize God was putting him in position. Because God was setting the scene and the stage for not only Absalom to come down, but Ahithophel. And so all of a sudden now, Ahithophel starts saying, well, you know what? Excuse me, Absalom starts saying, I don't want your advice right now. I'm going to listen to who shot now. And during these events, the writer makes it very clear. That, that it was very clear what was happening. God was using who shot. To ensure that his close servant, David, would be restored back to the throne. And, in, and to ensure the destruction of Absalom. And when Absalom decided to go with the advice of somebody else, a hit that they all knew. He went home. Got himself, his home in order. And hung himself. I'm talking about a great man of God who had powerful advice that was likened to God. I don't know about you, but if you, if you look at this thing, it, it, can be, it can be a thing that brings you to a point of, of reverence and fear of God. That, that, that here it is. I mean, you, you put a Hithophel in our modern day. Man, he would have a mega church. Followers by the many. Amen. Anoint, the man was anointed. We got people today that are anointed. But don't realize. With that anointing, there's something else going on in their life. Talented. But something's going on in their life. And they don't realize there's something that is going unchecked. And they think the anointing going to carry me. My ability to quote scripture going to carry me. My talent going to carry me. One chapter later, man, that when he opened his mouth, it was like God talked. The next chapter later, Hithophel finds out my word don't got value now. Goes, can you imagine walking home? Walks in the house, sets things in order. I don't know what that means. Maybe he talked to the family, said his so-called goodbyes, not really letting them know what he's getting ready to do. <laughs> Went to another room shut the door, and hung himself. Amen. He hung himself because of the seed song and the actions he took that were all fueled by bitterness. And the bitterness in his heart lasted until the last breath a hithophel breathed on the earth and not only did his actions affect himself they deeply uh, affected and wounded his friend David his actions caused the death of David's son Absalom and one can only imagine the effect it must have had on his son Eliam and his granddaughter Bathsheba I'm talking about the trap of bitterness. See, but what, what all this mean, Pastor? What, what, how, what, 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 how does this apply? See, we find that when you look at this story, really in this context, not only will bitterness poison you, but it will also have a lasting impact on the people around you and those that care the most for you. As with a, a hither there, there are people 
that are bitter. Yes, who have been hurt. Yes, who have been offended and wounded by others. But when they hold on to that bitterness and they refuse to let it go, that person becomes encapsulated by it, allowing it now to motivate their every conversation. Now when they talk, their whole conversation is motivated by the bitterness. Their every action is motivated by bitterness. To the point, you see what it did to Ahithel? It made me ask myself, could this be why people walk out of the church? Want to blame God. Want to blame the people in the church. Could this be that this is why in today's hour people are walking out on their family? Spouses that were quoting scripture on Monday. Nowhere to be found on Tuesday. Could it be? Could this be why you groups, you thought this would be the next one in line? Talented, gifted, but something is going unchecked. I thank God he put a piece in my spirit because I wasn't trying to move no emotions. But God put this in my spirit to preach this. Because the reason, and I'm, I'm not saying it, it's the main reason, but, but I, I was doing some study and, and there have been medical doctors that have noted that the main reason for burnout is not overworked, over this, over that. Many times burnout is a result of bitterness. And I ain't got time to bring all that out, but maybe I'll do it at a later time because I feel in the Holy Ghost, God saying, we ain't quite finished here. They held on to it. People are holding on to stuff. I don't, I don't know who this is for. And as far as I'm concerned, that's between you and God. But... I know I'm preaching to somebody right now. You are holding on to something. And to you, it don't look like much. It's just a little piece. It's just a little seed. It ain't much. Seed ain't even this big. Don't look like much, do it. But water it if it was a seed. Put it on some certain kind of soil and ground. Let folk God start getting all in your ear and talking to you. And it's not just people. I feel the Holy Ghost. It's not just people talking to some of you. Some of you got the voice of the enemy talking right in your ear. And this thing. It is taking its root. Everything now you do is motivated by that. How you treat people is motivated by that. And we want to say, oh, it ain't that, it ain't that. You know what also I found out by what, what a lot of medical doctors say? You can't tell a bitter person they bitter. You can't tell them. I, I mean, it gets to a point where now the results of the hurt is now motivating and acting revenge. And this can just start with thoughts. Amen. As the battleground is going on, it, it could just start with gossiping about that person. 
slamming them on social media. Slam them in that text message. Just between you and somebody else. Slam on them in them emails. Planting traps and hopes. Oh, uh -uh. oh, you know, I love them praying for them. Be real. Be real. Absolutely was talking with F. Uh, F How you feel about my dad? Oh, he's a good man. I gave him great counsel, great advice, great wisdom. But he would have been lying. Because in Hithadel's heart, he despised David. You better be careful for what people you let people speak into you. Oh, I don't go to Z Top no more, but you know how I feel about y'all there at Z Top. You still talk. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. You still talking to them. You still inviting them over to your dinner. And every now and then there's a little slight remark. Just to see. See if you're going to bring them back over again. I'm I'm liberal. I don't. I, if nobody texts me, call me, pat me on the back, I feel like I've delivered my soul to help somebody. You know, you, you know how First Lady is. You know how Sister Handy is. You know how Brother Andre is. You know how you know how he is. And then start gossiping and don't even know all the facts. Don't know the big picture. Don't see the big picture. <laughs> now I'm so I'm so liberated now. You can't be liberated when you still got this junk going on in your life. You can all you want. You can do that all you want. And, and, and you can look at me and not smile if you want. God see who you talking to. See, I ain't, I ain't trying to build no social club. I'm trying to help folk make heaven their home. I'm trying to make people make heaven their home. I'm trying to keep folks' marriages intact. I'm trying to keep men in the home, women in the home, children loving their parents. Hallelujah. We got too many people abandoning God, walking out on the church with all these excuses. But the real issue is there's a root of bitterness. Thank you. I'm glad the Lord sent you to get, get help me. Praise God. <laughs> Hither I'm closing. Lost his life. A hither there. Lost his life. His position. His influence. And then got to a point. See, when this stuff get in you, you'll start misusing the gift. He was gifted, but got this in him and started misusing the gift to destroy people. And you don't recognize it. You may be gifted, but if you ain't careful, the devil will set you up for a trap. And now you misusing what gift God gave you to destroy people in your life. All that greatness, all that potential, completely wasted and gone because of a seed of bitterness. Why would some of you would treat your life like you treat your yard? 
see weeds, getting them, I'm getting them weeds out of here. We going to Lowe's, baby. We getting some weed color. Get this stuff out of my yard. When we going to get some of this stuff out of our life? So God can grow the church. So the grass can green, grow and be green and flourish, spiritually speaking. All this wasted. A man of God wasted his life. What, I mean, what calling? Let me ask you. What, 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 now I'm asking a question to you. What callings? What testimonies of redemption? Giftings? And positions are being wasted and thrown away in your life because bitterness is being allowed to prevail. And stop making the excuse that it's prevailing because of somebody else. That ain't cutting it with God. Well, I feel this way and I am this way because of them. No! Only body up there thinking in your head is you. Nobody up in that head of yours but you. And the devil, if you let him talk to you. More so the bitterness that any individual holds on to will go on. We see it in the story. And I, I wish I had time to talk more about others. I, I don't have time. We see that it goes on to affect every future relationship. Bitterness that one hold, holds on to tightly from a past hurt, whether big or small, will affect your actions and how you treat people. It will affect your actions. Going back to my opening text, Hebrews 12:14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then end with no period. He, he continuing here. Looking diligently lest any man fail the grace of God or fall short of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be. To see, inwardly with bitterness, what, 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 let me just, and I'm closing, there, there will be nothing more than turmoil. And there will be nothing more than, than tension with you and with people. But upwardly, when that's there, there will be trouble between you and God. To the point you won't find peace, joy, or happiness whether you look in the mirror, outside the window, or look up in the sky. Bitterness is nothing more, and I'm closing, let's stand. It's a spiritual heartburn that can carry you everywhere you go. But I feel there's spiritual radiation. God getting ready to give somebody some spiritual chemotherapy up in here. He getting ready to burn out. Some, some stuff you can't get out until you burn it out. Lift your hands right now. Chains fall, fear thou here now. Jesus, you change everything. Life here, oh, found here now. Jesus, you change everything.